Okay. Um, so, it sounds a little bit distorted. Let's see how it goes. Um, so, I want to tell a story. One moment. Okay. So, just a little bit about myself. Um, I've been involved in Linux in an unusual way for quite a long time. I'm not a kernel hacker. I have a few tiny patches in the kernel. Um, but I've been involved with the Linux Man Pages project for uh, a long time. Uh, this provides the documentation of system calls and C library functions. Uh, recently I've been joined by a co-maintainer, which has been a blessing um, after working on my own for many years. Um, I wrote a book, um, and that's probably enough. Who has a patch in the kernel here? Okay. You do understand the notion of collective responsibility, don't you? <laughs> okay. So why am I here? Um, one thing is, I, I care about APIs. I'd like to see them done better because an, a misdesigned API, people have to live with it for a long time. Um, if it's broken, user space programmers have to live with it for a long time. But maybe I just want to tell a story, because one day I went down a kind of rabbit hole and found some really, really bizarre stuff. And I thought, ah, oh, there's a story here. And it's a kind of shaggy dog story, but I didn't make it up. You did. OK. The story is about a system call that was added in 1997, so a quarter of a century now ago. Um, it gives a bit of time for some perspective. And in 25 years, things change in interesting ways. So the system call was added way back then. It's one, of course, that probably many of you are familiar with, PRCTL. Back then, it did just one thing. And it's that one thing that I want to talk about now that has evolved over these 25 years. And the thing it does seems simple. But actually, when you look at it more closely, it becomes quite complex. And I'll also muse a little bit about you know, how could we reduce the possibility of these kinds of problems that are uncovered by looking at the, what this API does and how it's changed over time in unexpected ways. So, almost since the beginning of Unix time, there has been the sig child signal. It's the signal that gets sent to a parent process when, the child, when a child process terminates. Um, it wasn't there right at the beginning, but it, but it came on the scene very early on. And then, Quite a few years later, on Linux, someone decided that having the reverse thing would be useful. And this is a mail message from Richard Gooch, who used to be a, a kernel developer back in the day, who said, look, I'd like to have a, um, a, a feature where when the parent process terminates, the child gets a signal. And this was this new PRCTL system call with the option set P death signal, set parent death signal. Now, I don't know whether Richard Gooch wrote a, a man pages patch at the time, um, or whether he communicated with the man pages maintainer of the time, but the man pages maintainer of the time did add eventually documentation to, uh, to the man pages to explain what this um, new system called, what this new feature did. And what could go wrong? So the first thing was there were some missing pieces. And one of those missing pieces was there was an option to set this feature, but how do we discover if it's set? How do we discover its current setting? So a while later, two years later, someone added another option to the PRCTL system call called get p death signal. You know, discover is there a parent death signal set up for this process? And that seems even simpler. But we got the start of an API inconsistency because 
Um, this is an email from um, Tigran Ivatsian. I probably am massacring his name. But um, it was written after the fact to say, hey, I know I added this thing, this PR get PDF signal option, but I've realized we've got some inconsistency already. Because someone else, in the meantime, had added another flag to this. Is the sound still working? Suddenly it faded on me. OK. Um, another person had added, a, added a, a patch to set a, a thing called the dumpable flag and a corresponding getter. And the two different getters did things in different ways. One of them returned the setting as the function result. The other one returned the setting as an, via an argument. There was no reason for this difference in, difference in the way of doing things. It was just different people who made different decisions. And by now, we've sort of become consistently inconsistent of the uh, 15 uh, getters that return ints from the system call, um, sorry, I've got it wrong, 22, 15 return the, the value via the function result, and 7 return it via an argument. Um, maybe I could even say we've been inconsistently inconsistent, because it's not 50-50, it's two-thirds one way and one-third another. Well, it's consistently Inconsistently inconsistent. <laughs> OK. Now, what other things could go wrong? One of the things I find interesting is, you know, how does some new feature interact with other parts of the Linux API? And you can find surprises in many places, but often there are certain areas that are rich with surprises. And in particular, I'm talking about creation of new processes, execution of new programs, threads, uh, signals, signal del delivery s semantics, um, process termination. Um, oh, if file descriptors are in play, that can be quite interesting too because you have this mismatch or this, this, this idea that multiple file descriptors can refer to the same open file description. And the fact that there's this many-to-one relationship many times has created some interesting surprises for user space programmers. Okay, so let's look at some of the surprises to do with this API, execve. So um, back in the very first sort of manual pages patch that documented this API, this is the sentence says, this value is cleared upon a fork. Now when I see a sentence like that, I always immediately think to myself, OK, well, what about exec? What about exec VE? Um, those are two questions I always ask myself together. And I didn't see that or didn't notice that until 2014. This is 17 years after the API was added. And then I added the sentence. The value is preserved on exec VE. Now, this is 17 years after the API first appeared. And I wonder if that point had been documented right at the beginning, would people have noticed security vulnerability much earlier? And signals. So we have this idea if one process can send a signal to another, if there's either um, privilege involved or a credential match. You know, UIDs match between the sending process and the receiving process. And the question is, can we use this new feature to send a signal to a process that we could not otherwise have signaled? An attacker would like to be able to do that sort of thing, for example. So some scenarios. First of all, this is what PR, or this is what um, the PDF signal does. We have um, uh, a parent process that created the child, and I'm presuming, of course, that the parent and the child are unprivileged processes. The child does this operation, set p death sig, choosing a signal, and then later on, when the parent terminates, the child gets the signal. Okay, another scenario. Um, first pieces as before. Unprivileged processes, the um, child sets up the PDF signal, and then the child execs, let's say, a set UID root binary. And then that binary then 
changes all the credentials to something else, let's say 1001. Now at that point, the child process can't be signaled by the parent. Um, and so what happens then is that when the parent terminates, the child does not get a signal. Now this is all expected correct behavior. Okay, let's try something else. Um, everything is before, but now, before the parent terminates, it execs a set UID binary that changes the UID to 1001. Now, the parent process can't control this binary. It, it can exec it, but it doesn't control the code of the binary. But simply the fact that this binary gets exec changes the credentials to 1001 and then terminates. Now the child gets a signal. This is a path for a program that couldn't previously have signaled another process to actually signal that process. This is a security problem. Okay. That got fixed 10 years after the fact. Um, when someone finally reported, someone finally noticed. It got documented 15 years after the fact because no one told me. Okay, I just, I, I, well, maybe someone did tell me, but they told me long after the fact. I can't remember whether I discovered it or someone told me. So now the manual page tells us about this thing. And the point is, the fix was, if the child execs a set UID program or a, a program that gains privilege in any way by, say, having capabilities, then the parent death signal setting gets cleared. Okay, other surprises. Threads. So the original patch message said, okay, when the parent process terminates, the child process will get the signal. Now, I tend to think of process termination as being termination of the last thread. Okay, that's when a process terminates. But Certainly by the time we got the NPTEL threading implementation in 2003, that's not what this meant with respect to this API feature. Rather, and this was a bug report that got submitted, I think it was 2012, someone popped up with a bug report that says, I have a multi-threaded parent process. Um, the child has set up the PDF signal feature, but actually I'm not getting the signal when the parent process terminates, in other words, when the last thread terminates, I'm getting the signal when the thread that called fork terminates. Even if there are other threads in the parent process that continue going on. That's kind of surprising. That was, yeah, so that was 2012. So sometimes API designs only get reported much later. Okay. In PTL, that was 2003, here we are nine years later, someone reporting the bug. And of course, when that sort of thing happens, then you get this sort of observation, perfectly correct observation from Oleg Nesterov, yeah, this is ugly, but we can't fix it because maybe someone else depends on the brokenness. Um, so the best we can do at this point is document it. Okay, 18 years after the API was first added to the kernel. Um, the story actually with respect to threads is even more complicated than this, but I'll come back to that. Okay, some other details. Signals. So the child process gets a signal, and the question is, does it get anything else in the way of information when the parent process terminates? For a long time, you would never have known unless you read the source code. But, uh, I don't know, a few years ago I finally noticed or considered this question, what, else, what other information gets sent? Well, if you set up an SA SIGINFO signal handler, then as well you get to find out what was, you get the SIPID field, which tells you the PID of the parent process. So when the signal gets delivered, we also find out what is the PID of the parent process. Note, it's the PID of the parent process, not the thread ID of the terminating thread. Remember, the signal gets sent when a th certain thread terminates, 
But the information we're getting, at, uh, getting back in the SIPID field is, what was the signal? Or sorry, what was the um, parent process ID? So much for consistency in our API misdesigns. OK. Now, more surprises. Process termination. Maybe when the child gets the parent death signal, um, it, maybe the child wants to keep going. That would be a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Maybe the child just wants to know the parent's terminated and it does something with that information and then it keeps going. Um, what could happen then? Well, of course, once upon a time, the way things used to work on Linux, classically on Unix, is when a child becomes orphaned, it gets reparented to the init process, PID1. But things are different nowadays on Linux. We have this idea of sub-reapers, another feature that was added to the PRCTL system call. And what one process can do is say, I want to be a sub-reaper for my descendants. If any of my descendants become orphaned, then instead of reparenting them to init, reparent them to me. The, the most well-known user, perhaps, of this feature is um, systemd. Um, this is added 15 years after um, set PDAT signal first appeared. And the question is, how does this notion of sub-reapers interact with parent death signals? The point here is, a, because of sub-reapers, a child can have a series of parents, because the idea of sub-reaping is recursive. You can have a sub-reaper that says, my descendants, when they become orphans, should be reparented to me. But some further removed descendant could say, um, if my descendants become orphan, then reparent them to me. And what could happen is that uh, the, the, the second sub-reaper might terminate, and any children that it, get, that it has get reparented to the first sub-reaper. And when that first sub-reaper terminates, then those processes get reparented to the init process. So a child might get a series of parent death signals. Um, this finding got documented 21 years after the fact. OK. Back to threads. Suppose one of those sub-reaper processes is multi-threaded. When does the child get the parent death signal? Now we, we went into sort of you know stranger things territory quite a while back, and so let's be really expansive in considering you know the wild possibilities. Maybe the signal gets sent when the first thread in the sub-reaper terminates. Or maybe it's the last thread, or maybe it's when the thread group leader terminates, or maybe it's when each thread in the sub-reaper terminates. But it's just like one of those school tests where sometimes the answer is none of the above. Okay, and this is what I managed to piece together eventually by doing some testing and looking at the find new reaper function inside the kernel. Okay, the first thing is child processes are parented by individual threads. And if in the parent process the individual thread terminates, then the children of that individual thread get reparented. And at that point the child gets a PDAT signal. Now if the parent process was single threaded, then the child processes get reparented to the next ancestor sub-reaper. But if the parent was multi-threaded, then what happens is the children get reparented to another thread in the same process. Um, and how do we find that thread in the parent process? There's a search that starts from the order of thread creation. So, Maybe the thread group leader is still alive, then the parents, the children get reparented to the thread group leader. Maybe the thread group leader then terminates. Then the child threads will get reparented again to another thread in the same process, if there is still another thread in that, in that parent process. So what could happen is, again, the child process could get multiple signals. And actually, it's the same behavior for the original process, the original process that called um, PRCTL with the set P. 
key death signal. It's not just the sub reapers, it's just it's even the uh, the original parent process uh, the, of the child called set p death sig. At that point, my question was, do I dare document this weird behavior? So far, I didn't have the courage, but I think I've finally reached the point where I feel courageous enough to document it, because it's just so weird and horrible. The thing is, even if you don't document this behavior, if you give users enough time, they will discover either explicitly or implicitly every behavior of an API. Forget about documentation. So, what happened? The original author wanted the idea, the original author of the patch that implemented this feature wanted the idea that a child process would get a signal when the parent terminates. What did we actually get? Well, if the parent is multi-threaded, the child gets a signal when the creating thread terminates. If the parent process is multi-threaded, then what could happen is that as each thread terminates, the child process gets a signal. And those signals get accompanied by an SI PID value, which is the PID of the parent, not the, th the thread ID of the terminating thread. What we're getting happening here, of course, is some accidental exposure of kernel implementation details. Uh, really what should have happened is that child processes are child, children of the parent process, not individual threads. This, this should never have happened. It's an accident. Um, if there were ancestor subreapers involved, then the child process is potentially need several signals as the ancestor subreapers terminate. And if those subreapers are multi-threaded, see above. We got a security bug along the way, and we got an API inconsistency with those getters inside PRCTL along the way over time as well. And I think it's fair to say a lot of those behaviors were not intended. And the thing is, what went wrong? And I think there are a few things, but one of those things is there's no one person or group who owns the interface. Um, steady problem, I'd say, is lack of documentation, either no documentation or insufficient documentation. A lack of people who are looking at the bigger picture. How does this feature interact with the wider API? Which, of course, needs someone with fairly deep and broad knowledge. And there's not many people who have that knowledge or have the time to look at this stuff. And another thing that happened along the way, of course, is the behavior of this API evolved as a result of changes in the other parts of the API. The addition of sub-reapers, for instance, changed the behavior of the parent death signal feature. The addition of the NPTL threading implementation change the behavior of this feature. So it's an example of what I see, I've seen many times or what I've observed many times, decentralized design often fails us. So the question then is who does own the interface? And this was actually a question that I, was a topic of my talk at the first Linux Plumbers Conference back in 2008. Um, who owns the interface? In other words, who gets to say what is the contract between the kernel and user space? And the answer is far from simple. And of course, the first answer you'd say, well, it's, it's the kernel developers, right? It must be the kernel developers. They wrote the code. So surely they are defining the contract. But maybe there are unintended features of the API, things that the kernel developer never thought about. Bugs, for example. Um, and then there are other things that get in the way, like the C library, because the C library has wrappers for system calls, and sometimes those wrappers do extra stuff. 
So maybe it's the GLibc developers who define the contract. Because GLibc provides wrappers for most system calls. But often those wrappers are thin, so this you know, the, the, the GLibc developers are not doing anything beyond what the kernel developers did. And sometimes, of course, it's a long time or never for a wrapper gets added to GLibc. A wrapper for get TID, get TID finally got added 18 years after the fact um, uh, in, in GLibc, for example. Maybe it's me. Okay, I, you know, man pages documents the APIs. The idea is to document the contract. Uh, of course, the documentation acts as a, a kind of specification which could allow for testing. But many things are undocumented. And of course, sometimes the documentation is wrong. Maybe it's the user space developers. And of course, some you might want to say, well, how could it possibly be the user space developers? Well, given enough time, user space developers collectively will discover every detail of the behavior of an API. They'll either do it deliberately because they read the source code, they find out how the, the API works, and then they say, well, I'll use that feature, or they do it accidentally. They um, write some code that happens to depend on an unforeseen, undocumented feature of the API, perhaps even an API bug, but they've implicitly coded a dependency on that bug, for example. But the point is, they have filled in the gaps in what the kernel developer intended, what the documentation actually said, they filled in those gaps. So in a way, the users have ended up defining the API at that point. Um, an ancient example that I like to refer to quite often is this one. This is, again, an, uh, an unintended feature, I think, in the, uh, the, the API of the, uh, in the minds of the original developers. And this goes back way before Linux. You have files with this strange permission. And probably only some of you know what that means. It means that users in a certain group have less permissions than the rest of the world. And there are apparently weird applications out there by now that depend on this. If you give users enough time, they will invent every use case. So, lack of documentation. This was the initial documentation for this feature, PR set P death sick. That was all there was. This is what we have now. Okay? A lot more documentation. Now some of these features, some of these pieces of behavior didn't exist in the original implementation, uh, but a lot of them did. And I wonder if this stuff had all been documented up front uh, or as things changed, whether we might have done things differently. I kind of hope we would have, but the documentation didn't exist until well after the fact. That documentation could come in, in various forms. It could be a man pages patch, that'd be nice, but it could be a really well-written kernel commit message. Um, and if you do that documentation at the time the API is implemented, then it helps your reviewers. It lowers the bar for code review and gives you a specification for testing. Someone said it to me the other day, and I, who was it? Documentation is a time multiplier. It's like my bicycle. It gets me places faster. Who said it? Are they here? Thank you. It was such a nice sentence. Documentation is a time multiplier. Okay? It makes everyone else's life faster. I'm going to ignore the terrible problems that lack of documentation creates for user space programmers. That's a whole 
other talk. So decentralized design often fails us. Um, we end up with various strange things, inconsistencies. You know, uh, for those getters, for example, is the get in, the information that's got returned via the function result or via a function argument. Um, when uh, MPTL was added in 2003, this almost certainly changed the behaviour of the parent death signal um, uh, feature. And when subreapers were added, again, this changed the behaviour of the feature. And I think the point here is that in each of these respects, what was lacking was a failure to see the bigger picture. How are all of these things interacting together. And this, oh, that's a typo on my slides. It should have said PR set P death signal is a small lesson in the school of we don't do decentralized design well. We've had tougher lessons. C groups version one. Caps as admin, the overloaded capability. There's plenty of examples where decentralized design has failed us. Sometimes in small painful ways, sometimes in quite spectacularly painful ways. We've got too few eyes looking at the big picture. How does everything fit together and um, uh, interact with each other? And this requires deep, wide knowledge. And there just aren't enough people that are involved in that way. So what I want to say is, you know, why don't we have a paid kernel user space API maintainer? And once upon a time, I would have wanted that job. But I don't now. But we should find someone who does it, and, or someone's. OK, we kind of learned that lesson with C groups. Nominally, notionally, there is um, um, Tejan Hale maintaining C groups version 2 to try and prevent the possibility of C groups version 3. Um, but you know, we haven't solved the problem more generally in terms of the kernel user space API. So how should things ideally happen? I've a few ideas, but I just want to talk about a few of them. And one of them is no new API should be merged into the kernel without some real world users. Often we've had the case where a kernel developer said, oh, we could have this feature and uh, let's add it. And then we get real world users for the API. In other words, maybe the kernel developer has a real world use in mind, but that real world use hasn't been fully explored yet with a, a fully implemented user space application. Um, one of the sort of uh, most outstanding examples, at least to me, of, of something like that is iNotify. Um, the URL there is an article I read about iNotify probably about 10 years ago, where I explored the API and sort of saw all the things that are problematic for user space applications. And I don't think at least some of those things would have happened if a real world application had been implemented using iNotify at the time the API was added to the kernel. Okay. Every commit message, but especially those that add new interfaces, new kernel user space interfaces, would do these things. Explain why the change is being made. I'm still shocked at the number of kernel messages that just say, this is the change I'm making, without saying why. It still happens so much. Um, it would include explanations of why features are included, why features are not included. That's incredibly important because that, that's documentation of the decisions that you made to not do things. We'd have a version history. Um, we'd have URLs referring to mailing list discussions and 
I, did, I wrote these slides long before I know Christian would be in this room. Christian, are you here? Take a bow. If you want to see how this is done, go and look at some of Christian's commit messages. Okay? Some of them are just a joy to read. Okay. We have a manual pages patch written in parallel with the development of an API, not as an afterthought. Okay, because documenting an API, it's a great trigger for yourself, the developer, to rethink, to reconsider your design. Um, it lowers the bar for other people to understand what you're doing. Um, and of course, users will eventually thank you for that documentation. There's some other stuff as well, but you know, you know that stuff. And I'm done. <laughs> Thank you for your time. <laughs> and I guess I can take questions. We, Christian. We, we kind of do this already a little bit more that we can hear you. When we add new interfaces or when we add new APIs that we try uh, to at least get some users that either reply on the thread, we are going to use this in that way, or what we've done, it depends on how close you are with the project, right? If you have a large project that uh, is willing to work with you and you go to the large project, for example, SystemD, and you say, this is the interface, you want to make use of this interface, can you put up a pull request for the interface? But depending on how complex this is, you're asking a lot of the people as well. Like, you, do you imagine the whole FS Info's uh, debacle? I, I, I missed that last The FS thing. Info debacle, not debacle, but the discussion around adding a new FS Info system call. And so they, uh, uh, Util Linux or Libmount uh, to be precise and Systemd were made to implement uh, POC patches for this and then it never got anywhere and it was like massive amounts of code, 700, 800 lines of code or more. So it's, a, it's also a big af ask if you go to users like put up a pull request so that we have leverage. Well, I, I, I guess my thinking is that, you know, why are, we, why are we adding a feature to the kernel if there is not a highly motivated user who wants that feature and is prepared to do a bit of legwork to, to really test the feature. It's fair. That's fair. Although you also have to keep in mind that sometimes, you know, f features don't usually get merged that easily. I mean, it's a bit better nowadays, I would argue. I haven't been around this for as long as many others here in the room, but um, Sometimes you implement that version 1 and version 2 look completely different, version 3 and version 4 look completely different, so you know you have to iterate a lot, so yes. it's, it's yes. costly sometimes. I mean, the current iteration of, or for example, of a new substitute for the uh, FSinfo thing has nothing to do, like zero to do with the original implementation. I, but I get your point, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I can point you to an example in the Sockets API that goes back to 1983, of a misdesign that we still live with nearly 40 years later. And it creates a certain kind of pain. And, you know, yes, okay, there's work to be done to iterate, and, but, you know, let's save ye decades of pain. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's my argument, anyway. I, I mean, yes, I, as, uh, I guess a lot of people also here have programmed in low-level user space, and everybody knows how painful it is to just define all of the syscall numbers for the different architectures on older system calls or other API quirks that happen to exist. Yeah, sure. No. I mean, I'm, not, I'm not arguing against you. No, no, no. no. I, I mean, there are little improvements that we've, that I think we, we kind of made. I think, for example, when you, when we add system calls nowadays that require a bunch of arguments, we did work a while back uh, where we more or less formalized, not introduced, that would be saying too much, uh, the concept of extensible argument structs, so where you can uh, add a struct actually to a system call, pass a structure argument to a system call, version by size, and that works fairly nicely, so you can then have them extensible so that we don't have to go through all these except one, except two, except three, except four, and so on exercises again. But yeah. yeah. Uh, and the last point, the kernel API uh, maintainer, that's just an invitation for burnout. <laughs> I mean, 
Uh, like if you think about it, like uh, mandating API standards in the FS and in core kernel. I, I think what I'm, it would be have good to have more, perhaps more than one person even, who really it's their focus to look at the big picture. And of course, I realise there are big challenges in getting that sort of position funded, but you know I think it could really have long-term benefits. My auto? Okay. Um, I have a feel. I mean, you say a lot about like we should have better documentation and everything, but it seems like you. It was a lot of omission, and we didn't actually think about the interaction between X and Y, whereas we should have, like the X e, uh, exec VE problem. Um, and so, if the person who had designed the API had just documented the things he thought about, it would not really have helped the problem. And then other things came in later that kind of had an impact, and that wasn't anticipated at the time of the design. So I wonder if there's some kind of, um, I don't know, some kind of formalization or some kind of testing framework or something that one should have, which is like, if you have an impact on exec, you should have an impact, you should check exec VE or something like that, some kind of, um, if you have an impact on the relationship between parents and children, then you should check all of these other things that have an impact on I'm not, it's not very clear what I'm saying. Yeah, no, I, I, I sort of see where you're going, but I'm not sure if the, I, I don't know quite what you mean by a formalization, but at the some very kind of least. Tool. I mean, I always want tools, so some kind of tools, tool, which yeah. is if um, exec is in your documentation, maybe exec VE should be in your documentation as well, or I don't, I don't know. No. Um, um, but I don't know if it's feasible. I, I don't, I'm not sure there's going to be any solution to this problem that doesn't involve real humans yeah. looking at stuff. Um, it's a complicated yeah, but I, I problem. I wonder if real humans can like collect and advance interfaces or collections of interfaces that somehow relate to each other that have to be no. all considered. Yeah. I'd love it if there was something that could help. <laughs> okay. But I think there was, a, there was a question right up the front here with Willie. Watch out. <laughs> just one word about the last one, I'm sorry. Uh, when you are close to a speaker, uh, just move yourself because unless there is a last one very closely, this is why we had the issues uh, with your sound. So just be careful about these speakers. Uh, try to be uh, away from, from them. Thank you. Um. I don't agree with you uh, on one point uh, regarding the lack of implementation. In fact, I think that the worst designs came because there was exactly one implementation and uh, there was no analysis. For example, I guess this pair, uh, set this sig or whatever, uh, just appeared because someone had an immediate need uh, in production. He implemented exactly what he needed that filled the gap and that was okay. And uh, the scope was too narrow to analyze this, to, to analyze. And later, uh, the other ones appeared exactly in the same context. Uh, probably that now that we have uh, Git and uh, people get used to using it with sometimes correct co uh, commit messages, I hope that such uh, mistakes uh, will happen less often. But in my opinion, it's one example of the history of Linux, uh, which was uh, much less rigorous uh, by then, because you are speaking about uh, some syscalls which are two decades old now, and uh, I don't think it's that bad nowadays. Yeah. I, I don't disagree with you. Um, I guess the problem I'm thinking of is the case where there are zero implementations. You know, where's someone's waving their hands and adding an API without necessarily having a fully detailed use case in user space. Sure, but nowadays we have maintainers for every subsystem and uh, there are code reviews. I mean, we don't send a patch to Linux anymore who merges it uh, without uh, anyone complaining. It's much more difficult nowadays and I think that 
there is a big improvement on this area now. Okay, thank you. Oh, right down the back. <laughs> oh, oh. Yeah, um, playing devil's advocate on uh, the, the big picture that was missed for uh, this, this new Cisco isn't the problem more, more deeper. Uh, um, like typically we know as programmers, we know that programmers that mixing typically signals and multi-threading is, is always a nightmare. So isn't the problem when introducing the um, concept of threads we we maybe missed we maybe missed a lot of stuff uh, with interaction regarding signals i mean w w wasn't the the issue at the initial design of threads certainly the addition of threads created some holes created some a lot of strange interactions i agree but i'm not sure if i understand your bigger point no the, the point is uh part part of the mistakes that were done on this new uh, cisco maybe are inherited from the interaction between uh, the design issues between threads and signals in some cases i think you're right yes yeah so inherently some of those things were going to happen and, yeah, I agree. I, Oops, sorry. But you know, the, the, the particular cases that I talked about in my example, they are not about you know the introduction of POSIX threads per se. They are the way that threading and the relationship between the parent process and the child process was implemented inside the kernel. You know, the point is that in the kernel, children are children of an individual thread when they should really be been children of the process and therefore the parent death signal, the child should only have been getting the signal when the last thread terminated. And that's, that's not something that was forced on us by POSIX threads. That has been an accident of the specific kernel implementation. So uh, taking this thread example and, uh, in a more abstract way, right? You mentioned that the API should always have users uh, or implementation of the API when you're designing the API. But in this case, had the a person designing the API thought of all the possible use cases that can arise, explored the whole scope, this would have been, uh, this could have been avoided. I'm, I'm not saying the threads example, but in general. So it creates a dichotomy there. Yeah. Well, I think this particular story is kind of complex because at the beginning in 1997, the, the situation was much simpler, but then other pieces got added and they interacted in unusual ways. And so, um, you know, this is certainly not something I'd say was Richard Gooch's fault. Of course, yeah. Um, it's rather, you know, it became a shaggy dog story. You know, bits and pieces got added to the kernel and created strange interactions and no one was looking at the bigger picture as these things happened. I'm saying that in API design, you would, for a complex system, you would always have to kind of explore the unknown that may arrive, but you, will, you cannot ever possibly fully do that. So you need to have a backup plan for that as well. <laughs> I agree that you can't ever fully do that, but I think we could do better than we do. Yeah. A lot better. Uh, and there are some simple mitigations. You mentioned the documentation being a time uh, multiplier. I think the other thing that's a time multiplier is just call fuzzers. Because um, you, you said users are eventually going to discover all these things, but the other thing that helps discover all the issues and the hidden issues is the fuzzers. And I, I wonder if, uh, in addition to, you were talking about the you know, having better man pages and so on. I wonder if having like requirements around fuzzing new interfaces very early on before they get merged might also be a way to kind of combine the, the tooling factor because I think 
I think the, the, the fuzzers have also pointed out that they're finding more issues faster than humans can find already. So having this be a human solved problem is maybe harder than, than it is to have the, the fuzzers be involved in as part of the solution as well. Yeah, I, I, sure. Fuzzers can sh certainly sh find some problems, but I think some of these problems fuzzers couldn't have found. Right. Okay, that's the time to, for me to finish. Thank you very much.